Training camp started yesterday in the south side. It is on. Practice has started. The football season has begun. No, there isn't going to be a game for another like four weeks or something like that. But you know what? We're one step closer than we were yesterday because they're actually playing football in the south side. Pitt started training camp practice at the practice fields in the south side yesterday. Pat Narduzzi had his, held his initial media day press conference or his initial training camp press conference. We had media day with the players and all the assistant coaches. Lots of stuff was said. A few things were seen and a whole lot of conclusions were drawn by me and uh, those of us who were in attendance. So it's always uh, always interesting to get that first look at the players, first chat with the coaches, start getting a feel for who this team is. So what did we learn yesterday? What did we learn in training camp uh, day one? What did we learn from media day? What did we learn from Pat Narduzzi? A little and maybe a lot. And maybe a, a whole bunch in between. Plus, the ACC media poll came out. So, where did the Panthers stack up in that one? Where are they projected to finish in the conference? There's a lot to talk about here on the Thursday edition of the Morning Pit. So, let's jump into it right here on YouTube.com slash PantherLairCom. You know, I had this day circled on the calendar. I was like, this is it. This is August 1st. This is the first Morning Pit of training camp, you know, the first after the first practice at least. We had one yesterday on the first day of training camp, but this is the first one after the first practice. And I, I had this circled that I had to change that slideshow. No more spring game photos. Let's get some training camp photos. But I forgot. <laughs> so you still get a slideshow of training camp photos with Christian Bear getting sacked. Whoops. Uh, but at least Rasheem Biles, he's there in that picture. He's still on the, the team. Uh, he did not transfer. There's only a couple of guys probably who would show up in the uh, the photos there who transferred. But now we know everybody who's on the team. Nobody else is going to transfer. Everybody else is in. Everybody else is pretty much going to stay put. There, You might, I mean, you can't rule anything out. But it was funny. Pat Narduzzi had a comment yesterday where he was like, you know, from basically from January through July, it's like the worst time of year for a coach. And then once you get to August, it's the best time. Now, Narduzzi always clumsy with his words, talking about how the you know spring camp and recruiting are the worst times of the year. Uh, not exactly what he meant, but I, I, I think if I were to speak for him or to parse what he meant, I, I would say it's something along the lines of like, you know, at least when you get to August... And, and I would say that this is what Narduzzi is thinking because this is what I'm thinking. At least when you get to August, you know who the team is. You know who's on the team. You know who's going to be on the team. You don't have to worry about losing any more guys. It's highly unlikely you're going to lose any more guys. There, there have been midseason departures in the past, uh, certainly one or two here or there. But for the most part, you know who your team is and what you're going to have. And so for at least a little while, you can stop worrying about that. And Pat Narduzzi got into a discussion yesterday about the scholarship limits and scholarship numbers and the salary cap and all, all these different things that have changed as a result of the NCAA's house settlement. And, and I was going to ask him before our esteemed colleague E.J. Borghetti, uh, director of media relations at Pitt, chimed in and said, do we have any more questions about training camp? Uh, I was going to ask him something along the lines of, you know, as a head coach, do you take on more of those general manager positions or do you hire people? Do you, do you expand the staff to have people who to monitor things like scholarships and who's on scholarship and how many you're going to have money for this year and how the salary cap is going to get paid out and all those different things? Questions that I think are very reasonable for a Division One head football coach, particularly one in a power conference. Questions that probably would have been ideally asked over the summer if we had an opportunity to speak with Pat Narduzzi over the summer. But unfortunately, we didn't, so we had to ask him yesterday. But our esteemed colleague wanted questions just about training camp, wanted us to steer the conversation back to training camp. So we had to avoid talking about those things. Oh, well, we got at least a little bit out of Pat Narduzzi. But the reality is, you know, Coaches more and more are becoming general managers, and they're taking on general manager managerial duties in terms of roster management, and that's only going to increase before it decreases. Uh, that's that's put another way, it's going to get worse before it gets better. At least when you get to August, you can maybe set a lot of that stuff aside and just coach football, which I think is ultimately all these guys really want to do. They just want to coach football, and now. In August, you get to do that. And for us, we get to just talk about football. Now, I mean, granted, we've been talking about football for the past eight months, 12 months, 20 years, however long it may be. 
at least on on this morning pit program two years now three years something like that we started in 2022 i forget if this this might be the third season of the morning pit third football season i think we started ready to start of the uh, 2022 training camp um you know, we talk about football all the time, but at least now it's there, there are real things happening. There's practice happening. We're talking to the players. We're talking to the coaches. We're making observations. We're actually seeing the team with our own eyes. Uh, that's a nice, refreshing change, and it gives us plenty to talk about here. It gave us plenty to talk about on the live show last night. Hopefully you tuned in for that, and it gives us plenty to talk about here. Now, if you might say, wait, there was a, there was a live show? What, what did you have? You had a live podcast or something? What, what did you do? Oh, you don't know. We do a live stream right here on youtube.com slash pantheloracom every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. For one hour, me and Jim Hammett from pantheloracom, we get together and talk a little pit sports and uh, have have a little conversation about what's going on in pit. And we do it for an hour. And the chat screen over there on the right-hand side of the screen, you guys get to chime in with your comments and questions and be part of the conversation. We get to talk about what's going on. It gets even more exciting once we get to the season, but we'll have plenty to talk about over the course of this month. So make sure you tune in for those live streams every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Now you're worried you might forget about it? Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantheloracom. Turn on your notifications, and you will get alerts sent to your phone every time we go live, and that way you won't miss it youtube.com slash is the place where we're going to put all of our pit video content press conferences interviews practice highlights all of those things right here youtube.com slash pantheloracom and of course the website where we've got all of our coverage panther-lair.com pittsburgh.rivals.com and message boards to talk with other pit fan pit fans about everything going on in the world of pit sports all right what do we get out of uh first day of training camp well uh, Jim covered the practice in the morning. I came in for the press conference and the interviews in the afternoon. Um, and, and I would say a few things stood out to me. There's some overriding emotions with this team and this program right now. One is that they're still very pissed off about last season. I, I don't think any of, that, any of that has really dissipated. These guys are probably looking forward to training camp where they can maybe do a little more footballing and a little less thinking about the season that they just had. Uh, I mean, it's no surprise that everybody to a man said last season was no fun. Yeah, no kidding. It was no fun. You went three and nine. Of course, you didn't have a good time. Uh, But I think they're taking the right lessons from that season. Pat Narduzzi said yesterday that he thought the players maybe just walked into last season just expecting to just win a bunch of games. Um, Maybe that's what they feel happened in 2022. Lo and behold, they might have forgotten the game where they lost to a team that had fired its head coach four days earlier. Maybe Narduzzi's right. Maybe there was some assumption of success uh, by the team last year, and maybe they did get a little too caught up in themselves and and think too highly of themselves and think they you know, wouldn't have to put in the necessary work or whatever it is. Maybe he's right. Maybe they just had some really bad play at quarterback, some bad decisions by the coaches who were selecting the quarterbacks, and ultimately that's what sunk the season. I lean toward that explanation. Narduzzi can have his. But either way, there's still an overriding feeling of disgust about how that season went. There's almost an equal sense, from what I perceived, of confidence in this offense. Um. When you talk to the players or the coaches, in particular talking to some of the players about what they think this offense is and what they think this offense can do, there's a lot of belief that it will work. And I, you know, time and time again, all offseason, we kept asking that question. Will it work? Will it work? Will it work? Um, and, and that's a question we'll continue to ask until they actually play games and we see it live in person and we find out if it works. The players seem to believe. Now, Granted, nobody's going to sit there and say, no, I don't think it's going to work, man. I I think this is kind of a gimmicky offense, and it's crap that worked at Western Carolina, but it's never going to fly in the ACC. Nobody's going to sit there and say that, even if they believe it. Chances are, most of them, if they truly believe that, would have transferred after spring camp anyway. That wasn't the case. Uh, But I do get the sense in talking to these guys that, that they feel like it is the kind of offense that can succeed, that the scheme, the system, the design of the offense is built to succeed. Whether you're talking to players about what their roles are, talking to the coaches about how different players will be used, you get the sense that everybody feels 
the, the players or the playmakers, the skill guys on offense, the running backs and receivers in particular, and even the tight ends will get the ball in space with opportunities to make plays. Even Gavin Bartholomew said that Cade Bell has talked to him about how he can get him one-on-one matchups and get him opportunities to make plays, get yards after the catch. He said, that's what I, that's what I do. That's what I'm good at. Uh, and he feels like he's going to get an opportunity to do that. I, I thought Gavin Bartholomew yesterday actually looked a little slimmed down. Now he didn't have pads on or anything like that, but I thought he looked a little bit slimmed down. So I, I, I actually forgot to ask him if he had lost some weight. Um, that's neither here nor there. Uh, it was interesting. We spoke to a number of the offensive skill guys, Kanate Mumfield, Dejon Reynolds, um, Kenny Johnson, CJ Lee, Desmond Reed all came in and spoke to the media. Um, that might have been it that I saw of the skill guys, but I might have missed one or two. They had 12, 13, 14 guys in the uh, the media day room as we walked around to just sort of be able to interview anybody who was available. Uh, they just had them all at different tables. You could just sit down at any table and start talking to the players, and we we talked to a lot of them. I think between Jim and I, we probably talked to every player and coach in there. Um, but just the, 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 the general consensus among the skill players is that it's going to be an offense that gives them a chance to make plays. And, and I was talking, it was interesting. I had a conversation with Lindsay Lamar, the running backs coach. And we talked about Desmond Reed, you know, like how, how can you offset his size, right? The, the size is the size. And I feel like I had a similar conversation with J.J. Laster, the wide receivers coach, talking about Sensier Lee and Raphael Williams, two guys who are not big. And the general question is, you know, what can you do? How can you offset that size um, and and not make it a, a vulnerability? And and part of it was getting them the, the ball in space, getting them on the perimeter, um, creating opportunities for them to only have to make one man miss that, you know, that old thing of, you know, we'll block 10. You just got to take care of number 11, uh, and get past him. And, and then you can go a long way. Uh, I heard a lot of positive pub for Derek Davis yesterday. Uh, uh, Cade Bell talked him up quite a bit. Lindsey Lamar talked him up quite a bit. They're excited about his potential and his speed, what he can do. Uh, I think everybody there is excited about Desmond Reed. I think that there's a lot of belief that he – and, and I've, I've been coming around on this. I've been talking a lot about it lately. Like there's a lot of belief that Desmond Reed, the transfer from Western Carolina, is going to make a lot of plays in this offense. Um, to hear Lindsey Lamar say it, you know, one way they can keep everybody healthy and keep them on the field is by splitting up the reps. So it's Rodney Hammond working a lot and Der- uh, Desmond Reed working a lot and Derek Davis working a lot with Joel's golf having an outside shot at some, some reps as well. And that they'll split those reps up to maybe keep guys a little bit healthier, you know, not having guys who are 20 or 25 carry per game, maybe somebody who gets close to 20 touches per game. Cause it was interesting. I actually asked that question to Lindsay Lamar to the running backs coach. I said, you know, can Desmond Reed be a guy who gets, you know, 20 touch, 25 touches or 20 carries per game. He's like, well, I don't think he can get 20 carries per game. You know, we're not, we're not going to make him carry that kind of workload, but, but he seemed to say that 20 touches per game might be a possibility because they are going to throw the ball to the receivers a lot. And Cade Bell made an interesting point about this when he said that you know to him the quick game quick passing game is really an extension of the running game and we've seen that kind of offense before in 2019 Pitt really didn't run the ball very well or very often they were pretty bad at running the ball but they used the quick passing game to get the ball out and and basically in in place of the running game and it might only pick up two or three or four yards but that's what you know that that's effectively what you get out of the running game and that's how Maurice French ended up setting a pit record for receptions in a single season but he still only had like 800 yards it's because they threw him 90 some passes or he caught 90 some passes uh, and they were all like four yard passes or, or you know not all of them were four yard passes but a whole bunch of them were and I, you know, I don't know if Cade Bell is going to go quite as heavy on that kind of thing as as Mark Whipple did in 2019, but it's certainly something he's keeping in mind. And and it's it's screens and quick throws to Kanate Mumfield and C.J. Lee, but it's also throws to the running backs. The running backs, I think, are going to get a lot of touches this year, uh, carries and catches, and they're going to have you know the ball in their hands a lot. It's going to be a you know you're going to see it, and and you know whether they're. They're running on like little screens out of the backfield or whether they're moving out to the slot and catching the ball. I think it's pretty clear these guys are going to be involved. And like I say, Gavin Bartholomew envisions a big role for himself. I hope he's right. 
Uh, and the other wide receivers obviously are, are anxious as well. Um, on the defensive side, it, it was interesting to talk to a few of those guys. Not too many defensive ends. I don't know. You know, we talked to Jimmy Scott, and I think Nate Matlack was in there. Oh, and Chief Borders, which was interesting. They brought in Chief Borders to speak with us. Uh, he was one of the 12 or 13 defensive players who came in yesterday. Chief Borders, the transfer from Nebraska, a guy who's played, you know, as a, basically a stand-up outside linebacker, pass rusher in a 3-3-5 defense at Nebraska, converting, you know, transitioning into a 4-3 defensive end with his hand on the ground, pa rushing the passer in that way. Uh, a, a transitional role for him, a different kind of role than he's ever really played before. Um, but he must be doing a decent job with it if they're, uh, or, or the at least the anticipation's high if they brought him in to speak. Because, look, they're not going to, uh, you know, you don't want to overthink which players they make available on media day, but there is some thought put into it. You know, they only brought out, I think, one cornerback, and it was Ryland Gandy, who I've been talking about as the the main guy, the guy who's who's sort of separated himself. Archie Collins even said it that the one uh, the the one corner who has separated himself uh, in spring was Ryland Gandy, and he was the only corner who came out and spoke. And I, and I think that's relevant. You know, I think that's notable. They brought out. Uh, like I say, the two defensive ends. Well, Matt like and Scott, but then they also brought out uh, um, Chief Borders, which, like I say, is kind of notable that they brought him out. I, I wasn't sure what to, and I'm still not sure what to expect out of Chief Borders this year. Uh, but he is kind of a freakish athlete, and uh, you know, even though he's a little bit slight, he might be able to use some of that athleticism to offset his size because he's not the biggest guy. He's a decent size, but he's not all that bulky um but you might be able to use that athleticism to offset it and and make an impact off the edge i tell you who does look physically impressive and i saw it in the photos from the morning practice like no pad practice but the photos from the morning practice and then again later in the afternoon when we spoke to him at media day is anthony johnson former kid who went to Jeanette, Jeanette grad he actually grew up in like brookline or someplace but commuted to Jeanette, which that's a hell of a commute every day to go to school uh, but he graduated from Jeanette, went to Bowling Green, transferred to Youngstown State, transferred to Illinois just for the spring, committed to Mississippi State, ultimately ended up at Pitt. And he seems like he's happy where he is. He is huge. I, I mean, like, huge. Like, biceps for days. This guy's got some size to him. Now, I don't know if he's going to – I mean, he envisions himself as that quick twitch, pass rushing interior defensive lineman. I think everybody does. Uh, particularly since Aaron Donald, everybody thinks they're the uh, the pass rusher. Nobody wants to be the big, slow uh, run stopper, but somebody's got to be the big, slow run stopper, right? You can't just have all quick, small uh, pass rushing guys. Anthony Johnson's got the size, though. And it's going to be really interesting to see what he can do in this defense. They brought him out. It was good to talk to him. It seems like he's excited to be playing for Pitt. He's definitely excited to be playing in the backyard brawl. We talked to a lot of guys about that, and they're all really looking forward to it um, for sure. I tell you what, what else was interesting. They brought in three linebackers to talk to us yesterday. It was Brandon George, who's understandable. He's the oldest guy in the group. He's the leader of the group. And then they also brought in Braylon Lovelace and Kyle Lewis. Lovelace, a second-year player. Lewis, a third-year player. Both guys, I, I'm projecting them both to start. I think they both have a pretty good chance of being in the starting lineup. Um, and, and if they don't start, First of all, I'd be a little bit surprised, particularly with Lewis. But if they don't start, I think you're looking at two guys who are going to play a lot, see a lot of practice time, or, or see a lot of playing time, I should say, and, and make a big impact. But I, I think they'll be in the starting lineup. I, I would think the three linebackers they brought in yesterday, and I'm not just saying this because of media day yesterday. I, I've written it on Panthera.com a bunch this summer. You know, The three linebackers they brought in yesterday, George Lewis and Lovelace, I, I would bet even money that that's your uh, – the, 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 those are your starters this season. Those are your three starting linebackers. We'll see. We'll see how it pans out. But it was good to see all those guys. It was good to get it, get them in person, see them out on the field, throwing a football around. And, and it truly is the countdown to the start of the season. And today is August, August 1st. You've got 30 days until this season kicks off. Four weeks from Saturday, right? It's coming. It's coming real quick. I can't believe it. And uh, I can't believe it's the start of training camp. It's finally uh, here, and I think there's a lot to look forward to. Oh, the last thing. 
A lot of good pub for Eli Holstein. A lot of good pub. Spent a lot of time this summer talking about Nate Arnell. There's a lot of good pub for Eli Holstein. That's going to be something to keep an eye on. I still think Yarnell is the guy. I still think Yarnell is the starter, and I think he'll be the starter all season. There was a lot of talk about Eli Holstein yesterday. It's worth keeping an eye on. It's worth keeping an eye on. All right, we got the mailbag tomorrow. Don't forget, if you're a Panther Lair subscriber, get on there. It's on the message board. Submit your question at panther-lair.com. Go on the premium message boards between Fifth and Forbes. Find the mail time post and put your question in that thread. We want as many questions as we can get for the mailbag tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it as always. Thanks so much for tuning in today. It's been a lot of fun, as it always is. Another practice tomorrow. We'll have a lot of coverage from there. Uh, right here at panthelore.com and and actually here at youtube.com slash panthelore.com. So like this video and subscribe, youtube.com slash panthelore.com and never miss any of our pit video content. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We appreciate it. Have a great uh, rest of your Thursday. We'll catch up with you tomorrow for the morning pit mailbag and lots of coverage from training camp right here, youtube.com slash panthelore.com.